Hello, everybody, and welcome to How Stress Affects Children and Strategies to Buffer Them. My name is Brian Butler, and I'm going to be your facilitator tonight, and I'm so happy to have Daryl Webster with us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself to give you some background, and then we'll get into Daryl's history, and we'll get right into the questions that Daryl will answer for you all. And as I said before, I'm a retired principal, and I now go around the world uh, working with schools to help them work in teams to facilitate learning for all students. And so I've been fortunate enough to travel throughout the US, uh, Australia and Canada over the last three or four years. I spend about 200 days a year on the road um, working with schools. I've also and actually worked with DC public schools over the last uh, couple months. So I'm familiar with DC public schools, but I'm ultra familiar with Daryl Webster. Uh, Daryl is just an amazing human being. Uh, he was a teammate of mine at George Washington University. But I'm going to take some time to read through his bio and we're going to look at some of the, the things that he has done over the, the past 25, 30 years. So in the 1980s, Daryl started a nonprofit organization called Youth Entrepreneurial Services. Yes, to mentor youth. He was he was written about in the Washington Post a few times. Uh, he was Washingtonian of the year. He was selected as the national big and tall good guy by Rochester menswear. He was a USA Today newspaper honoree with himself and his drug buster award. He even appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show and was invited to the White House. In 1995, after three years working as a frontline social worker, he was featured in the Washington Post cover story that was nominated as a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Surprise. And if that wasn't enough, he was honored by the prestigious Father's Day Commission in 2006 as a National Father of the Year, All-Star. In 2007, the Gwendolyn and Morris Kofritz Foundation was honored as Distinguished DC Government Employee. Most recently in 2018, he was selected as the Maryland Social Worker of the Year. And congrats, Daryl, on your new book entitled, I Think I'm Going Crazy, Hope for People Battling Stress, Anxiety, Depression, which is coming out at the end of this month. Welcome, wow. Daryl. Hey, Brian, thank you so much for your willingness to facilitate uh, this talk on behalf of uh, the Tubman Elementary School. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. I'm really honored, Daryl. You know, we go back a long way. You introduced me to my wife, Kathleen, uh, back at GW, and I just... Um, think the world of you. And I know that um, the people at Tubman must uh, have um, hit, hit it off with you right away because of just who you are as a person. I wanted to get into our questions right away because I, I want to make sure that we get that information out to the parents and to your school staff because you are an expert expert in, in this area. Um, and because we are in such a, a crisis now with the COVID situation and the, the online learning, I know parents have a lot of questions. And so let's get right to it if you don't mind. Sure. All right, and so, you know, COVID-19 certainly has caused a lot of stress for, for a lot of people, for pretty much everybody. So this is a two-part question. To what extent has stress affected students in this new normal environment compared to pre-COVID times? And secondly, what should parents and teachers be doing to help those students manage this stress a little bit better? Yeah, great question, Brian. Yeah. As you know, Brian, having been a principal, stress was already a major issue for our children prior to COVID-19. Anxiety disorders and childhood depression uh, was starting to tick up. Even childhood uh, suicides was becoming an issue. And COVID-19 came along and exacerbated the whole thing. Our kids are, are really struggling right now, some of them more than others, depending on their personalities and temperaments. Um, because they're not used to this uh, lack of normalcy. This is an unprecedented situation that none of us are used to. The kids that I have spoken to uh, in my sessions have expressed a range of emotions from being angry to being sad to being frustrated. Some of them don't know what they feel. And it's important that parents and teachers understand that we have to show up for them every day and that be attuned, which means just paying attention to what their needs are emotionally, psychologically, cognitively, and just being available to listen. And if we see that they're having some challenges with anxiety and stress, 
we need to be very responsible and very responsive in a very loving way. Yeah. You know, Daryl, I read in your blog um, when you talked about stress and COVID-19 that you exp um, experienced stress as a kid. How did you know that you were ex experiencing stress and anxiety as a kid? Yeah, Brian, I um, grew up, uh, I wasn't a, a necessarily aware of it at the time. Now that I've gotten older and got some expertise and training in this area, looking back uh, over my life, I realized that I struggled with anxiety uh, and was very um, uh, stressed as a child. I knew because my a lot of my behaviors were off. I believe that I had social anxiety disorder. I didn't like to socialize with a lot of people in school. I struggled academically. I wasn't a very good student. I, I barely made it out of high school with a C average. And I suspect that the anxiety as a result of the stress that I endured had impacted my executive functioning, which is the part of our brains that deals with uh, impulse control, concentration, forethought, planning. And what the research shows is that when kids are stressed, a part of our brain called the brain stem, which is in the back of the neck, as well as the limbic system, those two parts of the brain in particular can be, can be very reactive to stress. And when they are reactive, they shut down the executive part of the brain and kids are not available to focus and to learn. So looking back, I realized it was definitely some anxiety issues related to stress at the time. You know, apart from COVID-19, um, we know as educators that kids experience stress. Are there different types of stressors that we should be looking for? And, and if we should be looking for those, what are they and, and how do we identify those and support kids? There are definitely different types of stressors. In my 28 years working at uh, various high poverty schools, I've learned a lot about the different types of stressors. Of course, we all go through stress. Stress is a normal part of our lives when it's, when, when it's acute um, and manageable. However, when the stress becomes toxic, in some cases, it can have some serious uh, damages and impacts on the kid's brain. And what is toxic stress? Toxic stress are related to what they call the adverse childhood experiences. And there are 10 of them. And I'm not going to uh, talk about all 10 right now. I'll just say, for example, child abuse and neglect, physical neglect, sexual abuse, uh, kids living in a home where they have a maybe their mom is being uh, involved in domestic violence, kids who are separated from a parent due to incarceration or death, those types of, of things that have a real impact on the child's uh, stress system uh, long term can impact them. And what was the second question, part of that question? Well, I said, you know, how should we help kids deal with it? And you've kind of talked about that a little bit yeah. in terms of what they were and how do we help kids? Because kids might think, as you did, that something's wrong with them. And it's not something's wrong with them. The environment is, is putting something in them and they're reacting to that. Great question, Brian. What we can do as parents and teachers, again, is to be responsive and be attuned, like attunement parenting, which means being very uh, aware of your child's temperament, of their personality. Are uh, they having challenges and struggles dealing with stress? Being supportive, showing up every day to support them in a very loving and, and responsive way. Dan Siegel talks about people um, um, helping kids to feel safe, soothe, and secure. And that's important to help them feel safe, uh, secure, and um, very um, relaxed. So the, the reason why you do that is because when you do that, kids, um, amygdalas and, and that primitive part of their brain, it stands down and executive functioning can come online. Yeah. You know, we've talked a lot, Dee, and, and I, I, I really just am so proud of what you've done in, in your life. Um, but we used to, uh, you know, on the road, room together at times, and we talk a lot mm -hmm. about our, our upbringing and our, our environments. And and we you know, talked about some of the, the things that stressed us out. And so one of the questions I have for you is, you know, how do social stressors like crime and drugs and homicide and in your environment coming up, how did that affect you as a child and a student? Hey, Brian, you know, you came to my in my neighborhood back before gentrification took place way back in the 80s. And if you can recall, uh, we had our share of prostitution and, and drugs and crime. And as a kid, I was surrounded by that. And that being a kid who was anxious, that made me very nervous and, and really challenged me every day to, to try to be able to, to function in a world that was very chaotic. Um, I, I struggled with that. 
but I had grandparents who were very loving and very attuned. And my grandfather showed up every day and was very responsive to me. He was a, such a nurturing person. And I would say what parents need to do is once again, especially parents who have kids who are living in neighborhoods, who are surrounded by drugs and crime, they need to comfort their kids. They need to, uh, I keep repeating that word attuned because that's the, one of the main um, skills and strategies that parents can use to help calm their kids' nerves down, to help the amygdala and the, and the primitive part of the brain to stand down so that the executive functioning part of the brain can be active. And, and more importantly, kids need adults to help them uh, co-regulate. Kids' brains don't fully develop until, well, a human brain doesn't fully develop until we're now, say, 25 years old. Mm -hmm. So from the time we're born uh, throughout our formative years, Kids depend on adults, a, a, a responsive, caring adult to show up and help them to co-regulate all throughout their developing years. Yeah. You know, Daryl, as a principal, and, and I'm not, all, not, not so proud of this, but when I first became a principal, you know, I would send kids home because of their behavior. Um, and I, I, I was really not really looking deeper at the cause, the why. Um, and, and looking at some of the environmental factors that cause that behavior. You know, in schools, you know, if, if a kid is lacking um, academic skills, we remediate, we intervene, we teach them. If they're lacking behavior skills, we've traditionally punished them, which has been wrong because how can we expect kids to have behavior skills if we haven't taught them? Right. And a lot of times those stressors um, really um, perpetuate some behaviors that kids, like you said, don't even know that they have. They just come out because of the stress yeah, yeah. in their environment. Yes. Uh, they say all behavior have meaning and kids are acting out for a reason. One of my, my, my favorite um, clinicians is Dr. Gaboa Mate. And he talks about, he talks about when people are playing charades, you can't use your words. What are they doing to get you to understand um, what type of character that they're acting out. They, they act it out. They don't use their words. He said, well, kids are acting out. They don't have the words sometimes to express how they are feeling. So they act out in a very maladjusted way. So it's important as um, it's important for, for, for teachers and, and administrators and parents to understand that type of dynamic and to, and to also to understand the brain science. I keep coming back to talking about these technical terms about the amygdala and the primitive brain. They call it the triune brain. And what does that mean? Evolution over time, our primitive brain was created first and evolved, and then the amygdala, uh, the limbic system evolved, and then the executive function in the first part, in the frontal part of our brain evolved. Well, unfortunately, our brains are still living in the ancient past with that primitive brain stem in the limbic system. We're, our brains are very reactive to all types of threats in our environments, and yeah. some kids, unfortunately, uh, living in environments where there's a lot of things for, to, to threaten them, to make them feel unsafe. And as teachers and parents, we need to be responsive. Once again, responsive and attuned. Um, support them. Help them find words to use to describe how they feel. That's imperative because sometimes kids just don't have the language. And we have to help them problem solve. Sit down and talk to your kids and give them the words that they use, that they can use to explain um, what they are dealing with. And that's, in, that's incumbent upon the adults. Yeah. And as I became more mature as a principal, I really started to label the, the behavior, label the skill that we were trying to teach the kids instead of labeling kids. And we should yeah. not be labeling kids because it's not the kid's fault. We're labeling the skill or behavior that we're trying to teach them. Um, in, in, or, in order for them to become productive citizens and adults. Yeah. And you, you, let's go back to your grandparents. You, you talked a little bit about your neighborhood and your grandparents and growing up in poverty. Can you describe kind of what that was like and, and why it was so important for um, you to have kind of a, an anchor in your grandparents um, during that, that turbulent time, if you will? Yeah, I, Brian, I, I grew up um, in the 70s and 80s with DC when DC was called the Chocolate City. Uh, I grew up in a neighborhood that was very poor. After the riots of uh, uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, I lived right off of the 14th Street corridor. Now it's a very gentrified place and everybody wants to live there. But back when I was coming up, no one wanted to live there. And uh, once again, the, the prostitution and the drugs and there were heroin addicts 
And it definitely wasn't a nice place to live, but when you're poor and you don't have the resources to live elsewhere, you make a home where you can. And my grandmother and grandfather did an amazing job making a home for their family. And they protected us from what was going on outside my door, from the social stresses. When we came home, we were surrounded by love and affection. And my grandfather, although he worked two back-breaking jobs, he always, when he came home, he sought me out to give me a hug or tickle me on the back of my neck or to look me in my eye and to tell me that he loved me. And that really helped me to calm down the anxiety that I felt. But unfortunately, when I went outside my door uh, to go to school in the morning or whenever I was outside with my friends, there were always some type of threat uh, lurking. You never knew when something was going to, to take place. And, and subsequently, when my own children was born, I experienced another uh, public health crisis with the crack cocaine epidemic. My son, Christian, as you know, graduated, uh, um, I mean, came up, he was born in 1990. When he was born, D.C. was known as the murder capital of the nation. And we lived in a neighborhood where young black males were dying, boys in particular, were dying in record numbers. And I worried, how was I going to take care of my son and raise him in the neighborhood where uh, we were surrounded by that? And I, once again, I had just I provided the same type of love and affection to him and my daughters that I that my grandparents provided to me, and it buffered them. It buffered them from the stress. Yeah, Darrell, we have one more question, but I'd like to you know just go back and just um, touch a uh, basis regarding your your new school, Tubman. Um, one of the things we've talked about, or what we've talked about, pretty much for the last fifteen or twenty minutes, is is students and the stressors that students have. But you know, I always told my my teachers, you cannot pour from an empty cup. And the stress that teachers are going through right now is 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 incredible. Can you talk to me about uh, Tubman and 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 I, I have the utmost respect for teachers of what they're going through right now and what they're doing um, in the face of uh, um, just hero just incredible challenges. And so, just can you talk to me about the the wonderful people that you talked to me before we got on um, the air about you know the people you work with at Tubman and what what they're doing for the kids, but also what they should do for themselves to make sure that they are taking care of themselves? Yeah, great question, Brian. Uh, Tubman, uh, what can, I can't find the, the marvelous words to, to, to use to describe Tubman. Principal Delabar has done a yeoman's job in terms of providing leadership for her staff in terms of being a trauma-informed and sensitive school. Uh, this, this woman has everyone on board with loving our kids and being responsive to our kids, as, especially in this environment with asynchronous learning. Some of the classrooms that I have popped in doing uh, virtual learning, I've truly, in, in some cases, almost was in tears watching the teachers talk to the kids in such a loving way. Uh, when kids are not showing up, they go the extra mile to ensure that the kids get into the classrooms and learn. And I was really surprised. We have a, a, a well-attended uh, virtual learning at, at Tubman, which shows that the staff are doing their due diligence, calling parents, getting kids online. And what I what I admire the most is that sometimes it doesn't even feel like I'm I'm in an asynchronous learning environment. I actually feel like I'm in class. The way the teachers have their Bitmojis classroom set up, it's just it's just spectacular to watch. And the kids talk to them in such an exuberant way, and the teachers they seem like they all are just on the same page, synchronized in terms of talking to the kids with a loving tone, uh, very responsive. The kids are responding accordingly. Um, and I really do admire the, the, the cultural piece. Some of the lessons that the teachers are providing are, are things that are right out of the news, things that are focusing on George Floyd and racial uh, injustice and those types of issues are discussed in a very empowering way. So Principal Delabar uh, is amazing in what she has brought to the school culture and what she has in, infused in the teachers and what they have meant to the, to, the, to the students. It's just a wonderful, wonderful experience for me as a new teacher there or as a new social worker. Wow. You get me fired up. You want me to, I want to come to school there. <laughs> I want to come to work for, yeah. for Principal Delabar. So, so one final question. Um, and, and you've taken this as your most important job as a parent. Um, you, you, we've talked about parenting over the years and, and you're um, proud of your kids, but you, you and your, and, and Debbie have really set a foundation for them to be successful. But talk to me about your, your three kids, um, 
Christian and Taylor and um, Tiffany. Christian and, and Tiffany, you know, had you know Division One scholarships and yeah. played basketball. Now Taylor is playing Division One yeah. basketball. Christian is now at, uh, at Virginia Tech as an assistant coach. Very successful, but it didn't just happen by chance. There was no. a lot of work that went into that, and and you as parents and other people in the community supported them to be successful. But can you talk to us about um, you as parents, but also um, why you're so proud of your kids now? Brian, um, my kids mean everything to me. I'm sure, um, like most parents, they want their kids to grow up and be successful and be good citizens and be good people. My wife and I uh, have been together since we were 17 years old. We're high school sweethearts, and we've gone through challenges like every other couple. Yep. And having grown up in the inner city with all the challenges and social stresses you and I just talked about, the odds were truly against us, not only being together, but against us to raise three successful uh, kids. Um, I never knew my father. My father wasn't a part of my life. My mother um, just told me recently, and I, I wasn't aware of it as I was preparing for my book, that when I was uh, six months old, that she was young. She, My mother's a wonderful person, but she was young. She didn't know if she could take care of a child. She right. was, she was, you talking about stress. She was under a lot of stress and she thought she went to give me away to another family. And she went to Pittsburgh and in the middle of the night, something, a voice came over her to, to, to keep me. And she did. And I vowed um, that when I was uh, coming up with my wife, that we were going to stay together, especially being two black people from the inner city. We weren't going to be another statistic, nor were we going to repeat the cycle that our fathers made by not being involved in our lives. So we were very diligent and very attuned. I keep coming back to that word attuned because our lives didn't belong to us anymore. We put all of our focus in our children. If I remember, I don't know how many nights staying up helping my son with his projects and making all types of, uh, uh, I remember one time making a Martin Luther King doll out of rags and cotton. I remember, I don't know how many field trips I went uh, on with my daughters. I don't know, I remember the, the, the number of basketball practices and soccer practices I had to show up for. But all of those, those types of experiences connected me with my children. It made them know that I loved them. Each year, on my birthday and Christmas, my daughters don't give me presents. They write me a letter. And I have those letters framed all over my house. And in those letters, they say some of the most amazing things about just the most recent one I got from, from, from Teller said, Daddy, you're the GOAT. And the GOAT stands for greatest of all time. And it really touched me as I uh, have grown older that my kids love me. They respect me, particularly being a black Father, and by the way, in 2006, I was uh, nominated, as you said, and, and received the National Father of the Year Award. And to me, that was remarkable because very few black men where I come from received that type of honor. But there, but there are thousands of black men from the inner city that don't get the credit that they deserve. They show up every day for their kids, and we just don't see those images on the news. But they're out there, and I've met some of them. And you're one of them, B. And I grew up. I grew up with some, and so um, I, I just want to say that being a parent is the is the most important job any of us will ever have. And you don't have to be perfect at it, because God knows me and my wife weren't perfect. You just have to be good enough. And thank God we were good enough. And so when my son graduated from Harvard in 2013, he was honored with their Male Achievement Award as the all-time winningest player in Harvard's history. And they had never won a basketball championship when he went there. And when he walked across that stage as the lone graduating senior, he gave, they had won an uh, NCAA tournament championship that year. He gave me his championship ring and he said, Daddy, thank you, Daddy. Thank you for being there for me. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's about loving our kids, being there for them, teaching them what they need to know, but most importantly, loving them in a way where they grow up to be good people. They grow up good people. They're good friends. You teach them those social skills where they can make a difference not only in their lives, in their family lives, they can make a difference in the world and be a good citizen in the community. Yeah, yeah Daryl, that's so important. And what you said is, is just, you know, perfect. I, I, and I also think that 
you know, when we're talking to parents, parents don't have to be, you know, a college graduate. You don't have to have a master's degree. It doesn't matter what your degree is. Um, it's not about that. It's about really just showing up for your kids and trying to make them have a help them have a better life than you had. You know, hey, Brian, had. let me interrupt you for one second. My grandfather only had a fourth grade education. Yep. He was not an educated man. My grandmother didn't have an education. But what they did have, they had a loving, caring spirit. And not only did they care for me and my cousin and my brother, my grandparents took in other people off the street yeah. that needed a place to stay. I grew up in a house where there was always someone uh, in need of a place to stay or a meal. My grandparents provided. Yeah. yeah, they didn't have any riches. And when my grandfather died, you would have thought he was a great dignitary. His funeral possession went on and on and on. And he was a man that was a poor man uh, financially, but he was rich in the giving spirit. And that giving spirit that he gave, it was given back to him with all of those people who came to say goodbye to him when he passed away. So, and I just wanted to share that because I wanted to make sure as we were talking to parents um, that every parent is, is equal. Every parent is, is special to their kid. Every um, parent looks at their kid and it's the, the apple of their eye. And so I wanted to make sure that parents understand that, you know, they can't opt out, right? Yeah, and yeah. it's not just because they don't, they, they might say, well, I don't have that education that Mr. Webster has. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. My grandparents too, my grandmother mother had a third, fifth grade education and my grandfather had a, had a third grade education. So um, parents can show up and parents can learn and, and, and support and work hand in hand with the school mm -hmm. and lift that child up. So um, that's it. That's all we have for you, Mr. Webster. Um, you did an <laughs> awesome job. I, I, I truly um, would love to visit Tubman um, at, at some point because it seems like there is a, a air of collective responsibility. Yes. Well, let me before we before we leave. Let me just answer that self care question with regard to the parents. Yeah. Parents, it's important. We're, we're all dealing with unprecedented times with the COVID nineteen virus. Um, a lot of families are impacted by unemployment. A lot of families have been impacted by loved ones who've come down with COVID. Uh, even my, my youngest daughter had COVID. Thank God she got over it. I just had a cousin that passed away from COVID. So this thing is devastating our communities. And unfortunately, it's impacting black and brown communities more than any other communities. So it's important that um, minorities and black and brown people like ourselves take care of themselves. Uh, eat a proper diet, get get the proper rest, because you have to be available to help your help your children. They say when you get on an airplane, they always say if the plane is in distress and the uh, uh, the mask come down for oxygen, that the person who is with the child should use that oxygen to make sure that they stay conscious so that they can be available to help that child. So I'm saying, parents. You guys are doing the best job you can right now, and we all are, we all are dealing with it. Let's come together as a community to support each other, and don't feel ashamed if you are dealing with different challenges, whether it be mental health. I struggle with mental health um, most of my life, and I got support and help for it. Reach out to people; you can't do it alone. Um, and don't be ashamed if you're dealing with unemployment or other types of stressors. We have some, um, we have an amazing community partner in our school, the Mary Center. Uh, our, they have some of the best, best clinicians in the DMV. Uh, the comprehensive services and mental health services and therapies they provide is second to none. And I, I recommend uh, anyone, any parent, Tubman parent, uh, that has any challenges in those areas, please reach out to us so that we can connect you with the Mary Center because I can vouch for those therapists and those clinicians. They're the most caring, responsive people um, that I've met in, in my recent career. So Brian, I wanna thank you, my friend. Um, I thank the world of you, I love you uh, for facilitating this. We go back a long way. We both have uh, overcome a lot and, uh, and we, want, we continue to make a difference. So thank you, my friend, I appreciate it. Thank you, Darrell. Love you too, and uh, great job. <laughs>